and welcome to Rainbow History Class, the queer and trans history that you probably don't get in school. My name is Rudy Jean Rigg. And my name is Hannah McElhinney. And thank you for still listening to us. Yahoo! Thanks so much. Uh, and welcome to another episode. Um, right off the bat, I do want to mention that we are going to Bris Vegas, baby. We're coming to Brisbane. Uh, we will be there in November as part of the Brisbane Melt Festival. We're doing our stand up comedy show three nights in a row, three nights only in November, starting off with Thursday, November 7th, uh, Friday 8th and Saturday the 9th, all at 6.45, all an hour of fun laughs and fun facts. Um, and you can get your tickets over at bit.ly forward slash RHC Brisbane Melt. So just get in case, em, get em. just in case you get distracted listening to us, I thought I'd jump in straight away and catch up while you were unaware. All right. Well, please come along and say hello. Uh, because it's going to be really fun. We know because we've done this show before. So, Many times. <laughs> um, we, it's, you know, it's, it's a good one. Uh, so I've got a story for you today. I was well, really hoping you were going to yeah. have one because I got nothing. That is the contract that we enter this studio with. Uh, but it's about music, so I want to do a little disclaimer up the top because typically, and I know this happens to a lot of podcasts, but when we talk about music, people tend to crack it if we include a band or an artist that you don't agree should technically be included or if we leave one out um, that you feel should be included. I want to say that like that is inevitable uh, because, you know, music's really subjective and also there's just so much music it's impossible to, you know, name check every single incredible band or artist in an episode. So please, if you want to get involved, Go easy on on us, um, but definitely chat to us in the Discord, um, which you can join or, um, yeah, let us know on social media. Yeah. But uh, today's today's episode I'm really excited about because it is going to reveal something about myself that not a lot of people know. Okay. Uh, And it has to do with my T-shirt. I was going to say, did you not get that the other night? I did. So I saw uh, Belle and Sebastian the other night, right? And they are one of my, I guess, oldest favorite bands of mm-hmm. all time. I've loved them for years. And I kind of didn't tell anyone that I was going. I didn't like make a big deal about, you know, being excited. You know, I wasn't like acting as if I was going to the Eras tour. Mm. I particularly liked this show because it, it was at a venue in um, in Melbourne called the Palais where you, you get to sit down, which <laughs> I, I feel like I've really aged into that venue. Yeah. But as I did, I came out yet again, but this time as Indie Twee. Okay. Right? And what's so weird is that I got all these people DMing me being like, I didn't even know they were playing. I love them. And despite the fact that I went with a few of my friends who we've loved Belle and Sebastian since we were, like, very young teenagers, I was like, oh, you listen to Belle and Sebastian? You listen to Belle and Sebastian? Oh, my God. All these people were just coming at me about this band. and It's like you were a priest in a confessional booth. Kind of. (laughs) All these other people started coming out to me as Indie Twee. And I thought it was interesting because I was like, I thought everyone hated Indie. Like, do you remember when it was kind of like hipster or Mm. Indie was just such a derogatory term oh yeah I was like deep on the hipster side of things um mostly because I was scared of weed and hipsters had wait more... you were deep into hating hipsters or deep into being a hipster I was deep into being a hipster I was like mildly famous on polyvore which was this site mm. where you could do like collages and my username was hipster island and I remember I was in this like war where we bullied people who would be on the indie side of the spectrum and we would like bully them. But I think I was a secret indie lover, but I was just scared of like the fact that a lot of indie people seem to purport that they smoked a lot of weed and that scared me for some reason. Um, but I feel yeah. Like indie rock is smoke weed, indie twee girls take it as oil. <laughs> no, I mean, maybe now, but back then hipsters had like. Um, but wait, hang on. You're saying you were a hipster yeah. and not an indie. Yeah. Yeah, got it. But like, and there was a lot of hipsters that were straight edge. That was like a, a subculture of hipsters. Yeah, okay. And I feel like we're getting into that mid 
the 2010s because it's like what's seen, what's hipster, what's indie, you know. The what, scene is nowhere near indie and hipster. I feel like, no, they were the, all the subcultures. Oh, yeah, yeah, emo. Um, of the time, yeah. you know. Yeah, mall goth, yeah. Yeah, all of those types of things. But, you know, I thought it was like everybody hated kind of indie and and I sort of see they, they were, were like indie and I would say like the indie hipster crossover but then also indie twee which was really kind of an offshoot um, oh yeah that definitely defined my adolescence but what do you associate indie twee with just can I reel stuff off yeah like think like films bands um okay vibes fashion <laughs> Um, okay, well, like, Indie Twees, like, you know, New Girl, like, it's Daisy Chains, it's Arizona Iced Tea, it's, um, like, a ukulele, it's the colour pastel yellow, it's where Anything Wears Anderson, it's, um, like, you know, like, Earl Grey, um, it's, like, yeah. Iced Peach Tea, I it don't is, know. It's tea, it's not coffee, it's all these things. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think if I think of films, the ones that come to most people of our generation's mind would be 500 Days of Summer yes. with Zoe Deschanel. Zoe Deschanel is very much... Just yeah. Zoe Deschanel in general. Yeah. Her band, She and Him. Yes. I have Wes Anderson on my list too. And then, of course, Garden State. Yes. Yep, 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 yep. All right. Um, I also think of things like cute manic pixie dream girls um, mm-hmm. in hetero relationships. Yeah. Um, probably like borrowing things that we would now call autistic like mm. autistic coded mm-hmm. like this this is the kind of um culture that I'm talking about in 2010 if that's what's in your mind when it comes to what indie twee is mm. um you wouldn't be alone but you would be wrong yeah okay yeah yeah because I feel like now I don't know where you're going with this but I will say when I think of indie twee it's definitely a retrospective label like it's it was not used at the time whereas indie and hipster were used at the time I feel like twee was used at the time but not indie twee Yeah and I guess I'm going to use twee because I'm going to I'm going to fork them off okay. right But I think what I want to do in this episode is stand up for twee and stand up for something that was really really important to me as an adolescent and going through like my teenage years and then maybe kind of I moved away from my roots and since going to this show the other night um have come back to them are you going back to your twee roots I'm going to my twee roots I know because I I think that was it was just such an important like culture for me yeah uh at the time so it's really nice to kind of look back and it's been really derided I think through the late 2010s and you know the that period of time has been kind of, yeah, derided as kind of a lot of things. I think it's also, um, yeah, I, I'd say it's definitely like overwhelmingly white, um, I guess, nauseating or people mm. have just moved away from it in mm. favour of other things. I think pop music had a revival after this that, um, which is great and I definitely, I love that too, that kind of pushed some of that indie music um to the back of people's mind when we got more options in the mm. pop space. Um, and also those kind of like non-traditional pop artists like Robin and um, artists like that being able to bring kind of alt pop grimes, that type mm. of um, artistry. The electronica. Think, yeah, like electronica um, and just kind of different pop sensibilities um, that weren't kind of m- – top 10 or billboard you know that kind of thing yeah i also feel like indie twee and like indie music it was ex- it was accessible as a consumer but also as a like as an artist because it like it didn't really require a whole band it you could kind of do it on garage band and upload it to like band camp well you know that's exactly right and that is going to get to the spirit of it so i think like if we think back to the 2010s uh that was really when a lot of us think of indie twee it mm-hmm. goes back quite a while before that and the version of the 2010s indie twee was a very kind of consumerist and very um sanitized version of it mm. and the reason indie twee works is because it is a punk genre that sounds like children's music yeah uh, and you need to have that friction uh, to kind of understand what's so great about it. Whereas I think in some of those um, 2010s bands, when it was coming back, it was just 
the children's music without the politics. Yeah, okay. So what is what is some music that in, really gets into that well, core? Well, all right. So there's if we go back to the first or what a lot of music journalists will tribu- um, attribute the rise of indie and this is indie in general too was a cassette tape it was a compilation um from NME and Rough Trade and it was called C86 oh all right and it was this uh, cassette tape with um a whole bunch of you know um band tracks on it and it was kind of this jangled pop guitar music. Um, the some of the bands on it were Primal Scream and like the Jesus and, Ma- Jesus and Mary Chain, and it got a lot of criticism at the time because John Peel from BBC Radio, he sort of associated it with shambling, which is a word I think he coined. I'm not sure, but it really glorified underachievement and these kind of really like. I guess people that weren't doing anything with their lives apart from like falling in love. That yeah. was that was it. And so this DIY aesthetic of it as well was criticized because people and this goes back to what you were saying, the guitar riffs weren't very sophisticated. Mm. You did not need to sing on in key. Yeah. Like you you know, you could just sing. It was all very DIY and was very untrained and so it led a lot of like music critics at the time to be like uh, and because it was pop music, it sat separate to punk. So people sort of didn't really know what it was. Mm. It's why are you singing, you you know, you're not, you don't have the musicality of, say, folk music. So what is it? Yeah. And yeah. that's kind of a lot of people will say, you know, was the beginning of indie was this C86 uh, cassette tape. Oh, my God. But then, of course, that's been disputed. Um, and I think... That you could reasonably say, or I will reasonably say, that indie did get kicked off from, or modern indie was kicked off from C86. Mm. But other journalists would say that indie twee came from a record label called Sarah Records, which just sounds twee. Yeah. Um, and this record label called Sarah was based in Bristol and it ran from 1987 to 1995. Wow. And so when we look at how far back we go to talk about Twee, it is 1987. So I think the other important thing is orienting it in a place. So the history of Twee came from working class Britain. Mm. Um, Bristol and Glasgow were two really influential cities in the rise of it. And so I think when we look at um, I think it, it when we look at where it's come from and why some of this indie music seems kind of overwhelmingly white and a bit naff um, in later years, I think that's because it's becomes it's become severed from its roots as like kind of Glaswegian working class mm. music or you know from places like Bristol. Mm. And this label, Sarah Records, was really political because at the time record labels were not political. If anything, they would tell their artists. Don't talk about politics. Don't in, unless it's some kind of you can only talk about famine message. Yeah. You can only talk about unconsensually touching someone, mm. and that's it, guys. And that's it. That's exactly. It. Yeah. Women don't speak. Stop speaking. Well, that's kind of exactly right because uh, what the bands that Sarah Records was signing. So Sarah Records was co-run by a woman Mm. and she would sign these bands where the women would play music or they would sing in harmonies with the men. But it was a shift away from the woman as front man who, or front woman, Mm. if you will, like who had to have like sex appeal Mm. or like the Stevie Nicks um, kind of aesthetic or women as kind of like sex symbol, pop stars, Spice Girls type thing. Yeah. Um, even though they were later, but you know, uh, so this was really, really kind of unique for this record, um, label and they were signing bands with feminist and it was very socialist and Mm. very queer aesthetics and perspectives. So it was interesting because it was this kind of jangly lo-fi, um, bedroom pop. Mm. It was that girl boy harmonies. So a lot, a lot of, um, Songs featured both um, a, a guy with a high voice and then a, 
a woman with an even higher voice and they kind of <laughs> sang without much power to their voices. Yeah. And the girl would be singing kind of prosaic melodies, kind of as if like Twinkle Twinkle's Little Star was a pop song. Oh, my God. And they they were untrained singers often and, yeah, often they just sang off key. I love that. I love that. Isn't um, who did it recently? Was it Says? Says.com. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And Nick Nick White, um, they're Australian um, creators and they recently did this, like, series of, like... The indie band covers different yeah. songs and they did Sabrina Carpenter Espresso. And yeah. It's so good. What's the lyrics to that song? Um, they sang it like... Uh, oh my god, I can't even think of how it was the like Angus song. and Julia Stone's version of Sabrina Carpenter, yeah. but they wore wigs. It was it was so good. You'll have to check it out. Yeah, um, Ever night oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <It's> <laughs> it was cool. But you know what was happening is the ones that we remember. So Zoe Deschanel being yeah. our pinup girl of indie twee. Mm. Her band She and Him. Did you ever listen to She and Him? Yeah, but I just didn't really know how to download it. I think it was like not in the rotation of USBs that I was given the, to download the music. With yeah, it. yeah, with the and with the ukulele. But often these were these really kind of simple childlike songs about like heterosexual love mm. like it was like boy meets girl type cute mm. oh, I listened to bright eyes a lot but I don't know there we go that bright eyes was like my vibe yep like yep Lua say- shout out Lua great song Paul yeah I'd, I'd say like same same kind of culture mm. but it's annoying because originally this music wasn't about these heterosexual relationships that was a real Zoe Deschanel um Injection. Injection. (laughs) It was more about women in bands kind of eschewing traditional musical training, singing and playing guitar um, and being more than a front woman. Um, But more than that, it was, and this is really important, it was sissy music. Okay. So that is the most important thing because people have long hated twee, right? So they didn't like it at the, the, yeah, I guess mainstream musical culture hated it at the time. Yeah. And people in retrospective um, lookbacks also hate it now. Okay. (laughs) But that's the idea of the the idea of anything twee Mm. um, people have disliked. So if you look at a dictionary, one of the dictionary definitions of it, it it means excessively or affectedly quaint, pretty or sentimental. And they believe in one theory about where the word came from is um, that it was born from a child missing, like mispronouncing the word sweet. Oh. So I don't know. This does feel like one of those kind of um, false. (laughs) Yeah. False etymologies. However, I think... The idea is is that it's if something's twee, it's not necessarily a resoundingly positive label. It sort of means that it's a bit fake or a bit saccharine, or like not much to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not not too much to it. Not much substance. I think that's probably a good. Um, yeah, that's a good definition. Mm. But actually, what Sarah Records was doing with this music was quite a lot. So one of their uh, artists they signed was called Blue Boy. Okay. Um, so Blue Boy was a British indie twee band and they were openly queer oh. in the late 80s. Oh, my God. And what's interesting, I think, is that while we have had openly queer artists throughout the 70s and 80s before, it was always done with a lot of camp and it was in the pop space. Mm. So they it, it wasn't about being a sissy because you were a rock star. Like yeah. even George Michael, who was very flamboyant and, you know, maybe not the most typical masculine man, he kind of was because he had the bravado. Same with yeah. Elton John. and But there was like a, a – there was a sex appeal for straight women with these people. Yeah. Which yeah. like I don't think probably these twee artists, like originally iconic twee, twee artists probably had. No. Like the mums of the boomer mums now would 
would not be lamenting about their straight crush they had on this closeted gay man in no, the 80s. definitely not. And I think that's that's the thing. There was no sex appeal to them, mm. but they were sissies, all mm. right? So this is a group of um, artists that they didn't, they weren't really classically trained. Their melodies were pretty and nice but very sad often. So it's sort of very sad soft boy music, you would call it now, with very chirpy melodies. Can I just, I don't know if, you, I don't think you'll understand, but there's this character in, um, uh, what's it called, in Overwatch 2 and there's this guy who floats, he's got no shoes on and um, it's this game, right, if those of you, his name is Sigma, which is so funny, and it's this guy who, like, floats in the air with, like, no shoes on, and he's, like, one of his voice quotes is, what is this melody? And it's just, like, he, uh, anyway, that's what I'm thinking of, like, all these people who hate Twee, just, like, consistently. <laughs> what is this? Yeah, literally, like, what is this crap? Um, yeah. Essentially, it really, a lot of the music does sound like one of those inbuilt backing tracks you get when you get a keyboard to learn to play piano on. I mean, I kind of love that though. Yeah, it's kind of, um, there is something really nice and joyful about it. But this was a label that was signing openly queer artists that represented everything the culture hated about queer people, in particular queer men. Mm. These weren't glamorous. They weren't camp. They weren't fashionable. They were sissies. And I think that is quietly radical um, of Sarah Records to do that. And then the reason that we get the word twee is because that was a like a pejorative term for these um, artists in particular, these male artists. So it was attributed to any musician that was not like a macho rock star or um, I guess for girls who took this childlike um, or prim, unsexy aesthetic. Mm. So, mm. I, Lisa Mitchell is another one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Australian yeah, yeah. artist, very twee. Very, yeah. very twee. Coin Laundry, absolutely slapped in the charts. Oh, that was. <laughs> Sorry, just but unlocked again, the memory. That was, okay, so that was Can I Be the Girl That You Met in the Coin Laundry. Yeah. That is an example of that heterosexual focus or yeah. boy meets girl focus of the 2010s True. versus the, um, yeah, the, the very sweet love that was the center of all of these songs. But I think these, these girls were unsexy. These boys were unsexy. They borrowed from the aesthetic of the sixties, which is where you get the Wes Anderson, Royal Tenenbaums kind yeah. of look from. They were the, they were borrowing from almost conservative styles. I was literally just going to say that like the styles are very conservative. They're very like not mod, but like mod, if modern hips, modern hippie had like a yeah. baby that had neutral political alignment. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, I feel like the, Interesting thing here is that this is how I embodied it, but I was not very well behaved in school. I never wore my uniform correctly at all. Mm. I was known to sometimes wear my uniform on the weekend and not during the week. <laughs> yeah, I dressed like a child. So I had a baby tee with a stuffed dinosaur a tie-dye dinosaur on it which I would wear with a pinafore dress yeah tights ballet flats and a beret yeah standard and sometimes my school skirt okay so that was the look I look back now actually now I look back now and I'm kind of into my fashion sensibilities of the time but it's very Lisa Frank yeah yeah, yeah. so I think the there's the opposite of bad girls in, in yeah. the twee. And but even if you were a bad girl, what you, were you being, dressed good. Yeah, and what were you being bad about? Yeah. Stealing a stealing a a packet of gum from the corner store? Yeah, or you were skipping class to learn French on your own. Yeah. Or, or go, read a book. <laughs> yeah. Or like go to a cafe and do watercolors. Ooh. Like, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So it's you were innocuous. like a bad girl, but a good girl. Yeah. So this is kind of, yeah, the word twee was very much an insult. And so these artists re like appropriated it 
which of course, as we've often discussed, is a very queer thing to do is appropriate something that's thrown at us. We sort of pick it up and put it on. Now, this was, so Sarah Records was the beginning of it um, and they had a lot of kind of queer socialist artists and I'm going to get back into why, where the socialism comes into it in a little bit. So Bell and Sebastian is enter them they're one of my favorite bands like I said uh, of all time and they started out in Glasgow in the 90s <clears throat> what a lot of people don't know about the band is that the <laughs> singer which is like a lot of things there's because, no Belle or Sebastian there's not a lot of people are like oh my god there's a lot of them no they were named after like a kid's book <laughs> um but the singer Stuart Murdoch had chronic fatigue and so he was chronically ill And so he got a grant from the Scottish government to kind of make some music and he did it and he recorded an album called Tiger Milk, which is the album cover I have on my shirt. Mm. And um, he also wrote a lot of these songs. One of their most well-known songs is called Sleep the Clock Around and it's about his experience with chronic fatigue and it really is that underachieving thing again. Like this is a group of people that, like when we talk about sissy music or underachieving, they're not macho, they're not going out and getting it, they're asleep or they're Mm. chronically ill. And I think something that we see now is just that intersection with a lot of people from our community um, and, you know, chronic illness or other things where we've got this political, I guess, political way of of resting Mm. um, and using rest as a way to resist capitalism. Mm. And I think you can see that on a lot of um, Belle and Sebastian songs, even though they have silly names like I'm a cuckoo and funny little frog. Yeah. So I should also say Stuart Murdoch isn't queer. He is a straight man. Um, And a lot of, while a lot of the songwriting from this genre is very queer it's not in a queer baiting sense because remembering that these were stories of like derided queer men this is not kind of coming out and doing it for you know sex appeal for women and things and he would write these songs that were very character driven but had a lot of kind of gender a storylines that dealt with gender. He ha- they have this song called Lord Anthony, which is about um, a young p- potentially trans woman mm. um, being bullied at school and that yeah. kind of thing. And I think that was my first exposure to any music that was at all queer. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, that's so interesting that you say that because I one of my favourite songs ever is called Poison Oak by Bright Eyes. And are you familiar with the yeah. song? Well, not the song, but yeah. Bright Eyes very much so. Yeah, I love Bright Eyes, but this song, and I, it, like, was Phoebe Bridges for me before, like, Moon Song by yes. Phoebe Bridges. Like, it's yes, that vibe. Yep. But there's, like, and this is my first experience of considering that trans people were something other than, like, used in film as, like, murderers. Um, the lyric, the lyrics are like in Polaroids, you were dressed in women's clothes. Why'd you, were you made a shame? Why'd you lock them in the drawer? And then they go on to speak about how this person ran away and how upset and heartbroken they were. Like, um, the, the, the singer is about this person, like feeling like this and whatever. And that was the first time that like, I don't know about bright eyes. I don't know about their identity or anything like that but like yeah it was the first time that I was exposed to transness in a way that wasn't from the perspective of trans people are bad yeah or even just for shock value yeah it was a story and it was and I think that's what I loved about this song Lord Anthony because it's really kind towards this person who is likely trans Mm. um and so I think that was that really like grabbed me by the by the throat Mm. and there is a lot of um similar songs in that in that vein and I think there were also other bands um that played in this space that were either queer or not queer in this sense it almost doesn't matter because the culture was all about being sissy Mm. and queerness was part of that because it was inherently kind of gender fucky but other bands who I loved like Camera Obscura um resonated because they 
focused on feeling like an outsider. It was all about kind of like running away or, you know, they have this song, Let's Get Out of This Country, which if you've grown up queer in the 2010s is probably a familiar feeling. Yeah. (laughs) But I think what's important about this through the 90s when they were doing it is it was politically radical and I think what has happened is it's been severed from its political ties because Mm. this was anti, this music was anti Margaret Thatcher. And so the (laughs) actual, um, when you say twee, although it doesn't sound punk, it is very closely linked to queer core punk. Mm. It's the same kind of scene. And these bands were, you know, from Glasgow. So um, Bell and Sebastian, you know, they, they were fighting against Thatcher's rule who at the time was just, gutting and ruining um, Scotland, England, Mm. life for the working class. Mm. And how that pertains to queer people is predominantly through Section 28, which is Thatcher's um, bill that banned the promotion of homosexuality. And that is essentially, I guess you could call it like a don't say gay type Law and it was in effect from 1998 to 2000. So what? Um, so no, sorry, 1988 to 2000. I'm just gonna check that. Yeah, 1988 to 2000 in Scotland and 1988 to 2003 in England and Wales. So while these bands were making this music in the 90s and late um, 2000s, they were fighting against a law that banned promoting homosexuality. So they were, in a sense, breaking the law with Mm. this music, celebrating sissies, trans feminine people, Mm. um, you know, other queer people. So that is why um, it really, really was radical. And then on top of that, you know, we know that under Margaret Thatcher, there were the miners' strikes. Yeah. As Margaret Thatcher closed all the pits, um, trying to increase efficiency and production uh, by going offshore, and that meant so many um, Welsh or um, English Scottish workers were left unemployed. Mm. They couldn't feed themselves, their families. It was really awful. And again, that. This music exists uh, against the backdrop of that. So when we look at like underachieving, if you have Thatcher on one end who was kind of ruthless in terms of productivity Mm. and increasing production at the expense of the people, this music was kind of radically soft um, against that. Mm. So uh, this was how it... um, I guess, came about and became popularised through political music. And we Mm. do know that politics were charged and queer people were really active um, against that, as we know from lesbians and gays, support the minors. LGSM. We'll do another episode on that at some (laughs) point soon. Um, But if you want to find out about an incredible story from this time, Watch the movie Pride. Oh, like literally I can't watch it anymore because it just makes me so upset. Like I, I, it physically hurts me. It is a stunning film. Yeah. And then also there's a strong anti-war bent to this music because the Falklands War was going on. And this was, again, it's anti-war, it's anti, um, you know, colonialism because the Falklands War was about the British crown shaking its iron fist, oppressing um, its territories. Mm. Um, so, again, so against this backdrop, this twee music was really a way to fight against that. And unfortunately, the music has been stripped of its substance Mm. um, throughout the late 2010s. But the reason that I thought to talk about it today was because at the concert that I went to, um, they had like footage from the Falklands War, from the miners' strikes, from Life Under Thatcher behind them while they were singing. That's cool. It it was really, really really good. So... That was 
a good reminder and I was like, God, it's nice to see these like two things paired back together. Yeah. So Belle and Sebastian had great success. Um, if we want to keep going into Twee and how much we loved it, of course, we cannot continue without saying bands like Tegan and Sarah. Oh, yeah. 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 were hugely important. If you were, like, sapphic in any way, Tegan and Sarah pretty much all you had. And they're kind of childlike voices and, again, untrained musicality mm. um, is basically, this. yeah, it's the soundtrack to a lot of my heartbreak mm. as a teenager. But, again, super influential. So it wasn't until the early 2010s there was, like, that big revival Mm. And while I liked it, all the queerness was kind of stripped away. Zoe Deschanel became the centre of it. Mm. She was not talking about the Falklands War. <laughs> um, God damn it. Yeah, Zoe. It was, it was all about, you know, Zoe Deschanel's cardigans. I know, and her glasses and her yeah. little silly flats. Um, bands like She and Him took off. But, again, it was these cutesy folk Tunes about heterosexual love and no politics. Yeah. I remember 500 Days of Summer, Garden State. I hated them when they came out. Really? Well, they were just so... Okay, so they were so queer in certain ways. Yeah. But so hetero. Yeah? Like, I remember being, at the time, just being like, Natalie Portman should just get a girlfriend. Yeah. Like, what's... Zach Braff got to offer her yeah, nothing. nothing. Um, but then I think when I think like screw them, I think mm. of another really important indie twee film. Okay, that means a lot to queer and trans people, or did at the time, and even more so does now. Um, Can you guess? Wait, is it uh, what country is it? It is American. American twee. It's got a very famous sissy actor in it as a man. I, You know what? I'm gonna, not going to lie to you. I don't really think I understand the concept of what a sissy person is supposed to look like. Okay. A very not a feminine and I guess weak <laughs> or awkward man. Um, a weak and awkward man. And it is also, okay, that's one, that's one clue. This okay. clue, you'll get it. It is, it stars a person who later came out as trans. Juno. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. So Juno. Juno is like a very important. Would you really call Michael Sarah Sissy? Yes, I would. Really? Yes, in Juno. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I just, I've only ever seen the word Sissy be used as like an insult. So I was just like, I'm defending I don't know if Michael Sarah is a good person, but like I was just defending. I mean, his I think character. being a sissy is a great thing, but yeah, I would say that in that film, he okay, was, he had sissy energy. Okay, hang on. So can I just pause here for a second and just do a little compa con contrast mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, compare? Mm -hmm. Tell me what you think. Uh, if if Michael Sarah and Elliot Page in Juno are twee, what is Jesse Eisenberg and Kristen Stewart in Adventureland? Is that hipster? To you? Like, would we say that? Maybe. Because they're, they're two – I'm feeling like they're two sides of the same coin It could almost. be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think when I think of Juno, if you think of that soundtrack, and I think, you you know, another – it's so bubblegum, that mm. story. It reminds me, and this is another very queer film with an indie twee soundtrack, but I'm a cheerleader. Yeah. So, again, bubblegum story, very sweet. Mm. But – also subversive in a yeah. sense. Yeah. I'm trying to think of other movies that kind of fit that. Juno really stands out to me. It's kind of clouding the rest of what Juno was Juno was an incredible film, except for at the time I was a bit like, well, not at the time but later I was, I was kind of like, isn't it a bit shitty that um, I'm going to, well, I'm going to use um, the character Juno with she, pro um, she pronouns. Yeah. Um, isn't it shitty that when she gets an, she goes to get an abortion and then a protester says, no, don't, your baby has fingernails. And then she's like, okay, fine, I'll keep the baby. And I was like, isn't that a bit, you know, 
conservative agenda. But then I saw this interview with Elliot Page where someone asked him that and Mm. he was like, you know, I never thought of that before. That's so true. But then he was like, I guess it would have been a short movie. Yeah. (laughs) If if Juno got the abortion, (laughs) that would be it. So I'm like, okay, I kind of get it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But I think that was the thing is like, a lot of people were just like, this is, it feels like a queer storyline. Perks of being a wallflower. Sorry, I've just. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Perks book? Of, yeah. Oh, Jesus, yeah. that poem. Holy moly. Perks of being a wallflower would be would be another one. Yeah. But I, I think with Juno, at one point, Elliot Page was like, yeah, Juno would have grown up to be a lesbian. Oh, yeah. But the only, you know, when I saw Juno deliberating with um, her friend about, who to give the baby up for adoption to. She's like, oh, maybe it'd be like a cool lesbian couple or something. That was, I was like, oh, my God, that means Juno's not homophobic. Yeah. That's so nice. And I I really loved that moment. Yeah. But unfortunately we all had to find the queer in it. And obviously now that um, Elliot Page is such an icon, mm-hmm. Juno, I feel like, it's just a queer film. Yeah. Would you say the same about the umbrella? Oh wait, no, it is pretty queer. The umbrella academy, but that you can't, it's not, it's not yeah. the same. I mean, you know what I would say is the same is whip it. But like, like that was queer to begin with. I know, but then she gets into, she gets, she just gets this shit boyfriend yeah. where I'm like, nah, you're a lesbian. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Like the beauty school, like the beauty pageant dropout mm. into roller derby. I'm like, why are you going with that? dickhead yeah yeah in a band yeah that is a queer film and i think that is so symptomatic of the 2010s where they're like yeah we can make him edgy but like there's gotta be a hetero couple in it or yeah it won't sell jennifer's body mm-hmm. jennifer's body that's another one um god it's just rife everywhere so that is you know the last time i think we left um that's kind of the mid 2010s mm. revival And we really had to then look for the queer in it. I think the semiotics were there. The music sounded like the original indie twee. There was the ballet flats, tights and cardigans, Mm. which was the look. Um, And I really came of age (laughs) in that time. But now when we talk about the twee revival for the third time, time when mm. everyone's talking about Mew Mew doing ballet flats again. Yeah. Still no one is talking about the Falklands War. I mean, I feel like though it will, it, it will um, uh, maybe uh, this is just wishful thinking, but if we consider the fact that we are going into what people are terming, which I'm not sure how I feel about quote unquote recession core or like we're going back into those same tempo aesthetics and, and inclinations um, and things that were culturally fashionable during recession periods, I do think that maybe there is an opportune time for Twee to come back to it. Maybe it's closer to its roots. Um, that's if the TikTok girlies don't take it and run, which we've got to really rip it Which I think it, it could because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of echoes of the original Twee period. You mm. know, like we are seeing just so much like colonial war Mm. you know we're we're going through a period of basically watching real-time genocide play out on Mm. our phones yeah Um, and on top of that we are seeing that happen in so many more places than we've ever you know seen we have obviously got things like housing um the housing crisis housing affordability just cost of living Mm. we have rising conservatism Mm -hmm. more like anti-abortion bills coming out of the US and we have, of course, multiple anti-gay, anti-trans bills mm-hmm. happening out of the US. There's a lot of similar things happening in the world. So maybe maybe there's opportunity for, for Twee to become recoupled with its political roots. Mm. Um, you know, it's always, it is, it's more than just ballet flats. And a daisy chain. And a daisy chain. There's a lot behind that daisy chain. And, you know... I'm glad that Zoe Deschanel can sort of stay in 2000 and, um, 2006 or something. Yeah. 
I do love that cover of Baby It's Cold Outside that she did with Will Ferrell for Elf. Yeah, yeah I did yeah. listen to that a little bit, an indie twee Christmas. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's hope. That is the history of twee. Thank you so much. I, I You really did jog my memory. Uh, but I, to be honest, it, it has been so bastardized. And I say that, like, respectfully. Like, it has been so removed from, like, the political ties that I just genuinely would not have known that or, like, there's nothing about it now that would tell you about that. And I just wonder, like, do all of these, like, apolitical people who, like, don't want to get involved in politics because, like, uh, it's just, you know, better to stay out of it um, know that, like, yeah. they yeah, you reckon they do? No, I no, don't. They don't. I don't know. reckon they know. I don't think that they think that – I think they think Twee is about – Ballet flats in 2007 core, mm. and they're not thinking that Twee always has been the music of queer people, of trans people, of the chronically ill um, people, like out of work and the socialists. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but look, that's um, that's that episode. So I will at some in some forum share my favorite my list of favorite um I'll put that in the Patreon um a playlist of my favorite indie yes. twee music oh my god that'd be so good that'd be really fun that you can listen to if you want to get more into it and I also take recommendations because I know that I only spoke about like three bands <laughs> um and I did that half on purpose out of fear of leaving some out but oh no leave them out uh, yeah, thank you so much for listening into this episode. And if you do want to connect with us, please, you can join our Patreon. Um, we do have a free tier, so no worries there if you're skint. And otherwise, there's always the Discord mm-hmm. and good old fashioned TikTok yeah. <laughs> and so and Instagram. You can find us at Rainbow History Class. Yeah, absolutely. And if you do want to come out uh, in Brisbane to the uh, powerhouse. Where are we at? Brisbane Powerhouse Theatre. That is going to be one powerful venue for us. Uh, you can head over to bit.ly forward slash IHC Brisbane Melt and come see our comedy show in November. That's right. And until next week, I will leave you with some parting words, and that is not everything is gay, but there is gay in everything, including definitely indie twee music. Thank you, Zoe Deschanel. Mm-hmm.